We have no way in which our past is going to be similar to our children's future. Currently, I think we're preparing our children for our past. I'm Jane McConnell, and welcome to Imaginize World, where we talk with forward thinkers, pioneering organizations, and writers of speculative fiction. We explore emerging trends, technologies, world-changing ideas, and above all, share our journeys, challenges, and successes. One of my first blog posts ever was back in 2005, and it was about Sugata Mitra and his hole-in-the-wall experiment. It was an ATM-type kiosk with a computer accessible through a window in a slum in India. Children gathered around and they taught themselves how to use it and did surprising things with it. Today, 18 years later, I'm talking directly with Sugata about his famous experiment. Sugata is a physicist and educational pioneer and the winner of a $1 million TED Prize in 2013. It's a prize that's given annually to individuals who have a bold vision and a wish to make change on a global scale. And this is what Sugata did. He had discovered, after trying the hole-in-the-wall experiment in several different places, that children can learn anything by themselves when given access to the internet in a safe and public place. He'll tell us all about how it led to the development of self-organized learning environments, S-O-L-E, and the concept of the school in the cloud. The TED Prize helped him spread the practice around the world. It evolved into a new approach to education in many places, some openly, other places discreetly, because it challenges traditional values in education, how people are recruited, taught, and measured. A fundamental underlying theme of Sugata is that we are slowly building collective value systems, consciously or unconsciously. This is possible because of the internet. At the same time, we're entering an age he calls the end of knowing. He says there's no way in which our past is going to be similar to our children's future. And currently what we're doing is preparing our children for our past instead of for their future. They need to learn to figure things out. It's what he calls the emergence of learning. In fact, we all need to figure things out, not just children, but all of us. We need to learn to search for answers to questions to which no answers have been found so far. His new research is absolutely fascinating and he shares parts of it over our conversation. I'll let you discover for yourself without giving any spoilers here, but it's really, really interesting. His view of the future in 10 years or so is very startling, to say the least. Some people find it scary, others find it inspirational. One thing for sure is, once you hear it, you won't forget it. So let's join Sugata. Well, hello, Sugata. It's such a pleasure to have this conversation with you. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. I've known about you for a very long time. I read an article in the BBC about your hole in the wall that we're going to talk about and wrote an article about it on my blog way, way, way back. And I've actually used that as a guideline in my, in my work when I work with people who want to want to learn about learning and how you can learn in different ways. But we want to talk about you And I know when we had our quick conversation the other day, you told me you were a physicist. That astonished me. Yes, I actually studied physics uh, ever since I left school. I, I, uh, you know, studied physics in my uh, university and then went on to do a PhD in uh, solid state physics. Uh, Actually, the theoretical side of uh, solid state physics in a, in a, what was then an esoteric uh, area, which is organic semiconductors. Uh, they're, of course, not esoteric anymore. I mean, you, you get TVs which have organic semiconductors in them, but uh, that's what my PhD was on. And uh, so I guess I was uh, I got trained as a physicist. I find that really interesting. And I've seen from reading about you and listening to different stuff online that you have taught at and gotten degrees from universities in India, in the UK, and in the US also, I believe. Yes. Well, I actually have, you know, kind of worked in uh, universities in India, the UK, and in the US, but I've studied uh, everything that I've 
then as a student and a learner has always been in India. I think the thing that, that you're the most famous for is the fact that you won the TED Million Dollar Prize in mm -hmm. 2013 for the School in the Cloud, which we're going to talk about. And I something really struck me when I read about that. I, I just want to quote a sentence from the TED website where they say this prize is given each year to forward-thinking individuals with a fresh, bold vision for sparking global change. And I'm struck by the fact they talk about a forward thinking with a bold vision and global change. That's a lot of criteria to meet. And you met those and you got your million dollars. <laughs> well, <laughs> I mean, you I, didn't I guess, get it, but you, you, you received the prize and you used a million dollars. <laughs> you know, I mean, I, I was, I'm of course very happy that I got that prize. But let me tell you, Jane, that these things, uh, awards, accolades, they, they're actually partly uh, because of what you've done and partly because of circumstances and fortuitous accidents, at least that's what I believe in. So, uh, uh, so yes, I'm very happy that I happen to be in the right place at the right time. Doing the right thing. Don't forget that. <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> don't, don't be too modest, Sugata. You, <laughs> what you've done is, is amazing. I'd be curious to know, what would you like people to know you as? You know, if people want to say, well, I know this guy, Sugata, he's a, how would you want them to finish the sentence? <laughs> well, I, it depends on what kind of answer you want. <laughs> I mean, I could, I, I, I was, while you were asking the question, I was thinking, well, yeah, but I, could, I could make a, a grandiose kind of, uh, uh, you know, view and, and so on. But uh, to be very honest, the answer that popped into my mind is a line from a song by Chris Christopherson. And that line is, he is a walking contradiction, partly truth and partly fiction. Ah, oh, I love that. Could you say that again, please? He is a walking contradiction, partly truth and partly fiction. That is really a strong, a strong statement. Uh, so you are a walking contradiction. When I think about that, in a, in a funny way, that doesn't surprise me because I think about physics, then I think about what you've done in the field of education. And maybe there are connections, but to me, they seem like two different worlds. Could you talk to us a little bit about your, uh, well, I'd like for you to talk to us a little bit about the hole in the wall, what you did, why you did it, and what it led to. Well, it's a story that's, you know, been told many times, uh, but, but uh, you know, the way it went was that back in 1999 or thereabouts, computers had just about entered homes all over the world and they were expensive, you know, uh, PCs they used to be called and yeah. they, they were big things that sat on a, on a table with a large monitor and used to cost over... <laughs> Anywhere on the planet, they used to cost about a month's uh, salary. Yeah. So, yeah. so you wouldn't fool around with them, and you certainly wouldn't let your children touch them. So, this was the 1990s when I suddenly noticed that the few friends that I had in India, I was in New Delhi at the time, uh, who had you know made the investment to buy a computer, were all saying something similar. They were saying that their children mm -hmm. seemed to be gifted. So now, I mean, you know, Jane, I mean, most of us think that our own children are all gifted. So, of course they are. <laughs> so, so then I asked uh, what happened and, and, and all of them gave these little anecdotes about how they were working on their computer, which their children were not allowed to touch. Yeah. When suddenly a little voice from the back said, Dad, if you were to, you know, press control, alternate and delete, uh, the whole system will boot up or something. And then they would turn around and say, how did you know that? And, and they said, well, you know, you did that yesterday. So they all concluded that their children were gifted because, you know, they were just picking up stuff by looking. Yeah. Well, I was happy. It, it's, it's always nice to think that children are gifted. I think children are gifted. All, all children are gifted. So I transferred that thinking to saying, well, if all children are gifted, then it's not only the children of those friends of mine who are gifted. It would also be 
children everywhere. And in India, where I was working, there are all these slum children, you know, children on, on the streets, ostensibly doing nothing much, just fooling around. And I said, well, they should also be gifted. It's just that they don't have a computer, that's all. So that's all the experiment was, you know, I just took a computer and I gave it to those children. How did I do that? Well, you can't give it on the street. So I, <laughs> I, I, made, I made a little ATM kind of thing in a wall on the street. <laughs> And I stuck this computer into that uh, three feet off the ground and just left it there. And the rest is history. I mean, within a few hours, the children were browsing, chatting, and people were saying, who taught them? And I didn't know. I thought maybe a passing guy who knew something about computers. So I repeated the experiment. I took it to a village very far from New Delhi where the chances of a passing computer professional would be zero. And I got the same results. Ah. The children, you know, the children would say, yeah, that's right. You know, can't you give us a better mouse or something? It's, it's not surprising today when, when your listeners uh, listen to this because they'll say, yeah, what did you expect? But, you know, in 1999, we didn't expect this. We didn't expect street children in India who had never seen a computer before, who had never heard of the internet, and who barely understood English ah. to actually do anything with a computer. But within a week, they were downloading and playing games from Disney.com. <laughs> so, so, so then I had to conclude that they, that the learning was happening. No one was teaching. The learning was just happening. Now yes. that's where, that's where, for a physicist, uh, it's not very difficult to to come to that conclusion, because in physics we have this marvelous thing that physicists kind of are both uh, scared by and love. It's called emergence. Mm. Emergence is when things happen with no ostensible creator or designer. It just happens. And I said, gosh, so this learning that I see with the street children on the internet could just be emergent phenomenon. Something that will always happen whenever you have a group of unsupervised children confronted with the unknown. So one thing led to the other. I managed to publish. And I said, I think this is emergent, that, that this is emergent learning. It's just happening out of, out of chaos. Um, nobody really took it very seriously, but they did take it seriously that children were somehow learning how to use the computer. Yes. Um, eventually, a uh, person who did listen happened to be, I mean, my, my sheer good luck, it happened to be Nicholas Negroponte mm. of the MIT Media Lab. That's a good, good contact. <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. And I got this letter out of the blue saying, you know, would you like to spend a year at the Media Lab uh, as a visiting professor? I was at that time uh, working as a professor at Newcastle University in the UK. Mm -hmm. So Nicholas uh, invited me to, to the MIT. And in the MIT, he said, this guy says that learning can be an emergent phenomenon in a chaotic educational system. And I think that actually got me the Ted Prize. The fact that people... Recognized it, accepted it. Uh, accepted it, recognized it, and also realized that here was a here was a mechanism that was essentially new. Yes. How far can it go? I did a whole series of experiments and finally landed myself in a position where I had to say that groups of unsupervised children given access to the internet in a safe and public space can learn, hold your breath, anything by themselves anything anything and people said anything exactly in the same tone as you said anything 
and, and I said yes. And there are experiments which I've you know written about uh, of the absurd happening of of village Tamil speaking village children, ten year olds uh, talking about DNA replication simply because there was a computer on which I said, you know, there's this, you see these squiggly little things which look like springs, they're called DNA. Now, that's all I know about them. And a month later, they said, well, you know, improper replication of the DNA molecule can cause disease. <laughs> that sort of thing. Yeah. So that's how I came to this conclusion that groups of unsupervised children given access to the internet in a safe and public space I like the way you emphasize safe and public space. That's yes. very important. And uh, the safe and public space is <laughs> because, you know, the first thing that people talk about when they hear children and the internet is, oh my God, all that terrible stuff. Yeah, yeah. But all that terrible stuff doesn't happen if it's safe and publicly visible to everybody. Okay. It's our penchant, our penchant, adult penchant for privacy. Yes. That causes all these bad things to happen. Now, is this where the whole school in the cloud came from, the, the, the phrase? and uh... Yeah, well, it actually went through a couple of stages. I, I brought the idea from India into England in 2006 and experimented in the schools in northeastern England, where I now live. Uh, it's a poorer part of England. And uh, I was able to show that the same conclusions the same mechanism will hold in England as well. In fact, it, it mm. holds even better because the children know English as their own language. We call that a self-organized learning environment. The soul, S-O-L-E, self-organized yes. learning environment. And that caught on and it moved all over the world, actually. It moved from, you know, I used to get invited to give lectures where I would describe how a soul works. And then teachers would try it. And it went everywhere, South America, Southern Australia, Southeastern Asia, India, and finally the United States, where we have this incredibly uh, nice organization called uh, 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 Start Soul, startsoul.org, which yes. you know, tens of thousands of teachers use. And it's I, kind I of... I saw that, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's kind of a mainstream method. You know, it's very simple. You you take children, you give them a few computers in a safe public space, ask them a question, and say, "Guys, do you know how this might work?" It better, it had better be a good question, otherwise they won't focus. But uh, that's where the teacher comes in, uh, not to give answers, but to make up a really interesting question. You know. You know, Sugata, that reminds me when you say that. I went to university in Arizona, and I had a geology teacher. He came in, stood at the teacher's podium, and did nothing but ask questions. He never gave us any information at all. He would ask a question and wait until someone, there's maybe 25, 30 students in the class, there might be lots of hands that would go up or no hands. If there were no hands, he would wait a while and then rephrase the question. And it was an entire semester of learning uh, from a teacher who never told us anything, who did nothing but ask questions. I've never forgotten that. It was a very powerful experience. Yeah, well, I mean, it probably is the, the best kind of teacher. And, uh, you know, by the way, the method that your teacher was using was actually more than two and a half thousand years old. Remember Socrates? He never said anything. He only asked uh. questions. Remember the Buddha? He never said anything. He only said the questions more important than the answer. So there have been teachers, almost divine teachers, who have always said the answer should come from within the learner. The question can come from the outside. So, I mean, not that I knew any of this stuff when I was doing self-organized learning environments. I, <laughs> I, I was just trying to get the children focused and excited. And, you know, to get a nine-year-old excited, you have to ask them a question. And also, if you, if, you, if you ask them a question and say, by the way, nobody knows the answer, uh -huh. the children get really excited. Okay. Uh, all this is true of the like six to 12 or 13 year olds. 
As soon as they get a little older, when the hormones kick in, the adolescents become different. <laughs> there the questions have to be different. There you yeah. have to say, guess what, guys? What do you think is the easiest way to become a YouTube millionaire? <laughs> and now the adolescents will focus. <laughs> and, they will, uh -huh. you know. and actually, so, they could probably learn something interesting yeah, yeah, from that probably. question. Yeah, of course. Of course. So the whole thing was about questions. Anyway, so self-organized learning environments. And then I said, well, what about, what if a school were to operate using self-organized learning environments as its main process? And I gave it the name, the school in the cloud. People still think that it's a, it's a website. It's not. It's got nothing to do with websites. Yeah. It's a physical school, except that it uses the internet intimately yes. in every part of the teaching learning process. You know, I did all my schooling in America, and I have not lived in America for a very long time, as I said. To be honest, I find it very hard to imagine from what I know about America, from people I know who live there, what I read, what I hear, I find it hard to believe that schools in the United States would practice this method. Well, I, I, I'm, I'm lucky because I've, I've happened to know teachers who do. And they say something similar to what you said, Jane. Yes. You know, what is amazing is that these teachers in the United States have to use souls almost as though it was something clandestine, something uh -huh. they really shouldn't be doing. Because, you know, standardized testing in the United States is... Uh, the U.S. can be terribly, terribly Victorian in its own way. Yeah. <laughs> you know, they don't... I, I'm sure they'll never... They will not agree with me if I use the word Victorian, but that's what yeah. it looks like to me. So, you know, uh, teaching should be lecturing and children should be tested and examined and, and all of that. In the middle of that, a generation is growing up with the internet. And their teachers find that they are unable to, to keep their learners' attention unless they also leverage on the internet. They use souls, but they tell me, by the time year nine comes, you know, about like two years before the end of school, they have to stop. Because when you're assessed, whether it's England or India or the US, when you're assessed, you're not allowed to consult the internet. You're not allowed to talk to anyone. You have to do everything with your own ah, head. That's a good point. Yes. Yeah. So what's the answer? The answer is, why do I have to do everything with my own head when I have a smartphone? In a child's language, when you tell them, do you know the answer to this question? The correct answer from a child is, give me my phone back. And that answer is not acceptable. So, so if we treat education like a big TV quiz show, where you're not allowed to ask anybody anything, but you're supposed to produce these answers like magic out of your own head, then the internet is of no use. But we know that that's absurd. We know that we all live by the, with the internet in our pockets, yeah. literally 24 by 7. We do everything with the internet except during the examination yeah. of children. At that time, we take away the internet and say, now perform. It's absurd. Yeah, well, maybe it will change someday. Maybe. Oh, it has to. It, uh, I mean, uh, not maybe. Uh, I, I used to think maybe, but I don't any longer. Because of a very simple calculation, look at how we access the internet. About 20 mm -hmm. years ago, it used to be with those desktop PCs and telephone lines and, you know, dialers, for those of us who remember that. Then it all changed and then it came into the mobile phone. And then the mobile phone became the smartphone and the smartphones got smaller and cheaper and thinner. And, and then it went into our watches. Mm -hmm. What's the logical next step? It will vanish. It will vanish into our eyes or into our ears or into... Then what are we going to do? Are we going to say to children before an examination, okay, guys, we are going to do an MRI or a CAT scan of you before you can enter? I mean, clearly, we will not be able to tell. In a few years' time, we will not be able to tell 
whether a person is using the internet or not. So I wanted to ask you, I mean, we're sort of joking, although I, I said we're smiling and laughing, but I, I can tell you're dead serious. You, you believe this is the future, don't you? In how, how many years? I mean, roughly, are we talking like 10 years? Um, well, uh, let's take 20 as a, as, as a measure. So let's okay. take 2043. Okay. All right. Now, I have a simple formula which uh, I would like to share with you about how to predict the future. Okay. Yes, please do. <laughs> 20 years from now will be at least as different from today as today is from 20 years ago. No one can, no one can argue against that, can they? So if 2043 has got to be as different at least from 2023 as 2023 was from 2003. What was 2003 like? Well, no Facebook, no Twitter. Uh -huh. Google was five years old, most likely. Ah, uh, no Uber. Oh. Uh, uh, no Deliveroo, a shaky PayPal. I mean, it was a world where many of the things that we do all the time, 24 by 7, just didn't exist. But don't you think there's an acceleration happening? That no, means no, yeah, that it's yeah, happening yeah. faster now? Oh, absolutely. You have to, you have to listen carefully to, to my prediction method, okay? 20 years from now will at least be as different <laughs> as 20 years ago was. Yes. And in practice, we know that it will be a lot more not just yes. at least, but for prediction purposes, I'm just taking this at least. Yeah. In terms of our perception also, because because things are moving faster, we sort of expect it to move faster. Whereas back course, in 2003, course, we weren't expecting all these oh, things to uh, happen. The Twitter uh, and the Facebook, they were sort of uh, out of the blue. Actually, that's how history operates. You know, in 2003, if you had subtracted 20 years and gone back to eight, 1983, they would have said the same thing. Well, yeah. things are going to move very quickly. Okay. And then in 2003, we said, well, things are going to move very quickly. And now in 2023, we will again say things are going to move very quickly. Well, yes. let, let, let's say it moves very quickly. We can say at least as different. So if Facebook did not exist in 2003, chances are it will be replaced by something utterly unimaginable by 2043. Yes. What will that be? Similarly for Twitter, similarly for Uber. But I think, I think there's one factor which will unify all of this together. That factor being, in 2043, we will no longer be able to tell if a person is accessing the internet or not. Hmm. When that happens, when you ask someone a question, you don't know where the answer came from. In mm. other words, I call it the end of knowing. Well, that's an exciting idea and it's scary at the same time. I know people find it quite terrible, to be, to be honest, and they often also misunderstand it, which irritates me. They often say, oh, Sugata said the end of knowledge. I'm not saying the end of knowledge. I'm saying the end of knowing. Where you, where you have no, then I started looking up, what does knowing actually mean? And guess what? There isn't a clear definition at all. When you huh. say, I, when you say I, I know how to cook a shepherd's pie, what does that actually mean? Does it mean that you have a recipe printed inside your head? Or what? We don't know what knowing means anymore. So in 2043, if your granddaughter were to say, I know how to make shepherd's pie, she's probably looking up a recipe somewhere inside a hippocampus, connecting God knows how. Does that sound absurd? Well, Facebook would have sounded absurd in 2003. True. So, so if it is the end of knowing, and I have actually a, an article called The End of Knowing, if it is the end of knowing, should we... Should we feel sorry or not? Well, let me give you another example. 
in 2043, your grandchild or great-grandchild will probably have a, an interesting question to ask you. He or she will ask you, what does driving mean? And you'll say, you know, driving. You see, there used to be these cars where you had to get in and there would be a wheel and there would be some pedals. And you have to press the pedals and you have to turn the wheel. And, and by that time, your great-grandchild would be laughing his head off and say, you mean you used to have baby cars with pedals in them? <laughs> you know. So what does driving mean? It doesn't mean anything. Because things drive themselves. What does knowing mean? It doesn't mean anything. Because things know things. Just like that. So, in that world, you have no way to tell what people know. You have no way to tell what languages they can or cannot speak. You have, you have no way to isolate a persona and say, this is how that persona differs from another. Because both are sunk inside a kind of a global internet that's probably, probably inside our heads somewhere. But don't you think we will have some individual agency over how our brain is accessing the internet? I'm not sure how, how I, to ask I, the question, but I yeah. mean, I don't think everyone's going to function the same way. I don't think that's possible. No, I'm, I'm sure not. I'm sure like any other thing, there will be different ways in which people will think about it. Just as if 10 people read the same book, they don't change in the same way. Different <laughs> people will react to different books. But imagine an age before books. If you were to say, there will exist one day a thing called a book by which everyone will know every idea. I mean, they would have probably, you know, burnt you at stake as a witch or something like that. Yeah. <laughs> it, it's, so, so also this idea of the kind of universal internet which everyone accesses invisibly all the time uh, sounds odd but will probably be the norm. Sukato, what do we need to do to be ready for that, to, to prepare for that? I'm going to assume you're right. What, what, what message do you have? What do you think we need to be doing if we're going to be moving in that direction? Well, the first thing, bring the internet into the education system right now. Bring it in every possible way to every question that you want to ask a learner. Ask them, can you figure it out? You know, I once said jokingly in a school that, uh, you know, in those old uh, Victorian schools, there used to be an archway on which the school motto would be written. And it was usually something in Latin, mm -hmm. you know, hey, hawk, something or the other. And it, it was the school motto. I think we need to change that motto. We need to change it to figure it out. That's what the school should be for. That's what learners should be encouraged to do. Go ahead, look up the internet, talk to yourselves, talk to each other, and tell me the answer. You figure it out. Why do we have to do that? Because we have no way in which our past is going to be similar to our children's future. You know, currently, I think we're preparing our children for our past. <laughs> That's a very good point. Yeah, preparing our children for our past, yes. We need to prepare them for, our, for their future. For their, their future, future, yes. And their future, I think, will be collective understanding. In, in a kind of a collective value system, where what is right and what is wrong is the average of the 8 or 10 billion people on the planet. You think that's possible to do? I think it's already happening. I think because of Facebook, because of X and things like that, your opinion of what's happening or what's going on is actually a collective opinion of millions and sometimes of billions of people. It's no longer 
what was written in a book somewhere. Mm. You know, right and wrong. I think that change is happening right in front of our eyes. We are going to have a big problem accepting that. Because we have one, one problem we have today. I, I'm sure you agree with me. We have the extremists. And we have extremists in different domains, politics, religion, uh, in different areas, where we have very strong opposing views. And they will, I, they build up their own reasoning, their own justification. And of course. So of how, course do we we get, how do we get through that? Well, you know, my feeling is that, once again, and I keep coming back to the same word, the internet, it, it will bulldoze its way through all of this stuff. It already has. Look at the way it's transforming war warfare. Mm -hmm. You know, th this whole idea of, you know, soldiers wearing helmets with guns, uh, you know, doing all that bravado in the streets and so on. The average 10-year-old doesn't find it cool at all. For her, warfare is where you have a little device, a little information device with which you do things. That's what they play with all the time. War is about information. Politics is about information. Beliefs are about information. If that is so, then the internet will obviously change all of these things. I have a, I have a website. My website is called Sevesm. C-E-V-E-S-M. It stands for Collective Value System. Hmm. And I think that that is the next thing that will come upon us when we accept the fact that what is right and wrong is what most people believe to be right or wrong. <laughs> it's a majority rules. Is that what you're saying? Yes, and which is what I believe it already is, actually. We just don't want to, we just don't want to accept it that way. But uh, a lot of things that we do, a lot of things that we wear, a lot of ways that we behave in, not because it's written in some book somewhere, but because we know that most people do it that way. I had an interesting conversation with uh, Stanley Chan, the science fiction writer, or I would say a science fiction humanist. Mm -hmm. I was able to interview him in Paris. He was in Paris, and we had it spent an afternoon together. One thing... It really struck me. He said, one of the biggest crises that we have today is lack of curiosity. He talks a lot to children, classes in, in China, and he wrote a book in Chinese for children to make them aware of the environment and the net zero and the, those problems. And so he's invited to talk over Zoom or in person. And he is struck, not just in China, he spent a lot of time outside of China, a lot of time in California, in fact. Um, and he says the biggest problem is lack of curiosity. People are not curious. Do you agree with that? Um, yes and no. I, I do have a lot of experience with uh, young people, with children particularly. Uh, as I mentioned, between the ages of 8 and about 12 and 13, that's, that's the lot that I've dealt with. I, I don't think there's a lack of curiosity. I think there is a lack of the confidence to express curiosity. Hmm. Well, it's quite different. It's, it's very different. They ask questions of each other when they're alone, but they don't ask those questions to the adults. I don't know why. I think maybe because they think that adults live in a world where we believe that every question has been answered. Science has the answer to everything. Which is why every time I've tried a question and said, guess what? No one knows the answer. Everybody sits up. No one knows the answer. You don't know the answer. No, I, I, nobody does. No professor, nobody. Okay, now they'll engage. So I had made a suggestion, which I still may, that we should change the curriculum from the things we know, you know, right now in a school curriculum, we teach them things that we know. We should change it to the list of things that we don't, we don't know. know. And then we'll get back that curiosity again. What, what, is, what are your 
plans. I mean, I don't want to get too specific if you're doing things that you're not ready to talk about yet, but in terms of the future and the work you've done in education, what we're talking about now, how do you see what you'll be doing evolving over the next five, 10 years? Well, you know, uh, I, w- I wish I had a fantastic answer to say, you know, there's an incredible secret thing that I'm working on, but it's nothing of the sort. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing of the sort. I, I retired in 2019. And, right. Uh, I, and I, I retired, meaning, I, yes, I seriously retired. So what did I do? Well, back in my university days, I used to be a good programmer, a really good one, even if I say so myself. Right. So after I retired, the first thing I did was I went back to programming. Huh. I started writing programs. And I wrote all kinds of programs. Uh, among them, uh, something that I had been curious about for a very long time is about what are called binary strings. Binary strings are just zeros and ones, you know, a whole set of zeros and ones. Now, if you take Beethoven's Ninth Symphony and you convert it into an audio file for a computer, then that audio file is a string of zeros and ones. Okay. And if I take Picasso's famous painting, the Guernica or something like that, and I digitize that and I feed it into a computer, then that also becomes a string of zeros and ones. I did this. I took two of these great works of art and I chopped a random section of that string, you know, maybe a hundred thousand bits, zeros and ones, out of the Ninth Symphony out of the Guernica. And I wrote a statistics program to say, tell me, what do these pieces of string represent? The statistics, the statistics gave me a very, very interesting answer. The statistics said, both the strings are random. I said, what? Beethoven, Picasso, random? Well, the statistics said there are as many zeros as there are ones, and they're distributed the way they would be if we were tossing a coin. So there's nothing to tell. No patterns they could find. No, no. no pattern. So I said, good Lord, then where is the meaning? Where is the meaning in that binary string? I had, when in, in a long, long time ago, I had written an article once. It's called Meaning in Binary Strings. And it was actually published somewhere. Where I tried to... To look at this, I went back to that after retirement. And that's what I'm working on right now. To say there has to be meaning in it somewhere. Where is it? So you're looking for the meaning. I'm, I'm looking for where inside a binary string does the meaning exist when statistics says that it's all random. Hmm. So uh, I haven't made much progress yet, except that I keep bumping into these really strange things. I'll give you just the hint of an answer as far as music is concerned. The programs that I wrote were trying to tell me that a string that represents music contains meaning in the silence. What's it trying to say? Well, I haven't gotten very far with it so far, but I can tell you the one sentence that's inside my head right now. It's trying to tell me that music is made up of silence. That sounds like a a cosmic joke, doesn't it? Well, it's the silence between the zeros and ones? I guess so. I guess so. I I guess it's the... No, the silence is also represented by a set of eight zeros and ones, but that happens very, very frequently inside that. And it reminded me of a, of a fantastic conversation that happened once between, a long time ago, between Albert Einstein and the Nobel Prize winning Bengali poet Rabindranath Tagore. And Einstein, uh, Tagore had invited Einstein uh, to Bengal and Einstein was talking to Tagore and said, you know, I work with space and time and the two things are related. And Tagore says, in most things, yes, but you know what? Not in music. So Einstein says, 
what about music? And Tagore said, music exists only in time and not in space. And I don't know how Einstein reacted to that, but I think the two of them were actually became very good friends. But anyhow, so w when I saw the results of that little experiment I was doing, and I looked at the, the fact that most of music seems to be constructed with silence, I thought of Tagore, and I thought, okay, so I'm looking at something which doesn't exist in space. It exists somewhere else. It exists inside time. That is fascinating. I wonder where that's going to take you. I don't know. The good thing about retiring is you don't care, do you? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, <laughs> it'll take me where it takes me. Wow. Well, I sure would like to have another conversation with you when you see where you are, <laughs> yeah. if, if yeah. that's possible. Yeah. And I, I mean, I'm sure there will be other people also who will, work, who, who will work on this. The other thing that fascinates me is, uh, uh, like mo it fascinates most people, are uh, these generative uh, AI models. Yes. You know, like ChatGPT or Google's Gemini and so on. So when they first came in, in 2022, a lot of people used to ask me, so what do you think of this and what do you think of that? So I said, look, I, can't, I don't think anything of these things until I know how they work. So you know what I did? I, only a retired person would be foolish enough to try this. I, what did you do? I, I took my little notebook computer, a Dell computer, the one that I'm talking to you on, and I wrote a generative AI program on it and discovered very quickly that it won't work with that little computer. It needs a really big computer. And I said, and I, and I knew something really good about generative AI. It's not a war of algorithms between OpenAI and Google. It's a war of money. Oh, Who can the power afford, that you need. Yeah, yes. The power, the computing power that you need to, to build. I learned how these things work. It's a fascinating understanding. It's a fascinating understanding because like that work with, you know, music and uh, binary strings, this one also had absolutely terrible, terrible answer. What it says about human thinking is that it, doesn't actually exist. What does exist is the ability to predict what they call the next token, which means that as I'm speaking, what my brain is doing is that for each word that I speak, it very quickly assigns a probability to what I should say next. And it builds the sentence up like this rapidly inside my head. And that's what the generative AI does as well. This is not thinking as we understood it at all. This is another cosmic joke. Mm. There is no grammar. The syntax lies inside the probability. There is no meaning. There is no thought. It all lies inside a cloud of probabilities. And it all lies within a cloud of all the stuff that they analyze, that the that, uh, that you just the feed, them, every, been, you feed yeah. them everything there is on the internet yeah. and then you ask them a question and it doesn't reproduce an answer from what it has read. It actually creates the answer, but it creates it by taking a word and saying, this word should be followed by that word and then that word should be followed by that one. And out comes a sentence which makes sense and you think it's thinking. And um, Well, that's why it makes mistakes also. Well, I mean, so do we, actually. So it's actually, not, yeah. it is, it's, not, it's not a big deal. I, I, you know, I keep pointing this out to people that why, why are we so strict with, with AI saying, oh, it said, uh, it talked nonsense or it, it hallucinated. I mean, haven't you talked nonsense and hallucinated? Of course you have. So, so it's, part of, it's part of the probability cloud going wrong once in a while. Well, it looks like you're going to have a pretty interesting retirement. But so far, I have a grandchild who has just turned one. He was born on the same day as Chat GPT. Really? <laughs> that's, a, that's a sign of something, don't you think? <laughs> yes, that's right. So, but anyway, when I look at him, he's now one. And I keep thinking, well, 
what can I as an educator say about him at age 30? He might be living on Mars. Well, what am I going to teach him? And out comes my old motto. The only thing I can teach him is figure it out. Figure it out. That's great. So, Gata, I think we're probably going to close our conversation on that very, I would say, wise term. We went all over the place. <laughs> we followed a illogical path to somewhere. We just have to figure it out now. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Well, thank you very much for this conversation. It's been very stimulating. That's the purpose of this podcast. I call it Imaginize World. And it's a question of imagining something before we can create it. I think you're an example of a person who does that. Uh, or maybe you don't imagine what you're going to create, but you have a, a sense of a direction. Well, is that true? Or is that, am I reading too much into it? Well, if you want a one-liner, remember what I started yes. with in this conversation? Partly truth and partly fiction. Fiction. Followed by the line which I didn't say, taking every wrong direction on his lonely way back home. Right, that gives thanks. me plenty to think about for the rest of the evening. Thank you, Jane. Thank you. Lovely to meet you. Thank, Thank you. you for having me.